Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today on this beautiful day here in uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, but I also hear it's a beautiful day in Toronto as well. During this time of social and physical distancing, SACPA believes it's important to keep engaging with the public on issues of the day, and in order to do so, we are very thankful for the continuing support we've received from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Our speaker today is from Toronto, it's Desmond Cole, and the topic is Tackling Systemic Racism and Police Brutality. Desmond Cole was born in Alberta, grew up in Oshawa, and attended Queen's University. He first emerged on the public stage with his dogged challenges to the practice of police carding in Toronto. He spoke out at community rallies and at police service board meetings. He wrote articles, including one for the Toronto Life magazine in 2015 about his own experience. Cole became a columnist for the Toronto Star and resigned when the paper discouraged him from continuing his advocacy work. He's now a leading activist and critic of systematic race, racial injustices targeting black communities across the country. Desmond Cole is also the author of the book, The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to your talk. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's just afternoon here now in Toronto, but good morning to all of you. Thank you, Annalise. Um, thank you to your organization. Thank you to my friend Martin Heavyhead for reaching out and um, extending this invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. I would like to start today by asking everybody who's joining us to reflect on an image that I imagine that you have seen from a couple of weeks ago. And that is the image in Minneapolis, Minnesota of the third police precinct in that city burning to the ground. This was an image that traveled all around the world when it happened a couple of weeks ago. And I'm asking you to reflect on that image because I want you to reflect on how that made you feel when you saw it, or how it made you feel to hear that black people were marching by the thousands in the streets of Minneapolis or in other cities. Um, I think that we have been conditioned, and I say we knowing that we are in a different country from Minnesota and Minneapolis, but I'm talking about the regime of policing that is common to the United States and Canada, which we're going to discuss today. We have police station burning to the ground as the ultimate symbol of lawlessness, of social anarchy, and of disorder, and perhaps even violence. But what I would like to suggest to you today is that that image of the police station burning in Minneapolis is probably the most hopeful image for black life that has been broadcast on television in my lifetime. And that might sound strange to some of you, but that's fine. We're going to have a conversation and I'm going to tell you more about why I feel like that. Um, I am 38 years old. And as was mentioned, I was born in Red Deer, Alberta. I am the child of immigrant parents who came to Canada from Sierra Leone in West Africa. They came to Red Deer in the 1970s, where my sister and I were both born. Um, the story of my parents' journey to Canada is very common for Black immigrant families in this country. They didn't actually come because they were fleeing war or some kind of emergency, they came to Canada for economic opportunity that they didn't believe they could find at home. Uh, what my parents did find when they came here was certainly much economic opportunity. My father became a uh, registered mental health nurse, and uh, my mother ultimately also became a nurse and still works in a nursing home uh, in my hometown of Oshawa. Um, so great success story, right? You come to Canada, you start a different life, you have children, and you hope that the um, 
upward mobility that you experience as a black immigrant will be passed along to your children so that they can have even more opportunity than you did. You know, both my parents had to go back to school as adults in order to have the opportunities that they did. So it was definitely their hope that my sister and I would have an easier time of things. What's reality, though, in this country for black people? The reality is that we are living in a country that has been stolen. We're living in a country dominated by a white colonial government, a government that is still loyal to the Queen of England, a government that still says that the Queen of England is actually our head of state. Uh, she's on our money. We swear oaths to her when people become citizens. And we still have this tradition of British monarchical power. Uh, my parents are very familiar with this reality because, of course, Sierra Leone was also colonized by the British, just as this country that we now call Canada was. And so that's the reality for every black immigrant in Canada. It's the reality for every immigrant period to this country. It's also the reality, more importantly, for the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, whose lands have been stolen from them by white settlers. Um, no matter what else you want to say about Canada, that is who we are, and we don't get to escape that context. We don't get to uh, say, but we're different, or it's better now, or we have more opportunities, or Desmond, everything's changing. That is our heritage, and that is who we are. This country was established in order to maintain white supremacy. White supremacy is not just an ideology. White supremacy is a set of systems. White supremacy is the belief that people who are designated in the white race are the superior human beings on this planet and that they actually have a God-given right to dominate and rule over all of the other races and of the natural world. Um, you don't have to like that. You don't have to agree with that yourself. That is the foundation of your country. And far from believing that, well, that was how people believed and thought back then, but we've changed our beliefs now, you don't just have beliefs that uphold white supremacy. You have institutions that actually do the bulk of the work. And the institutions perpetuate the ideology. So the institutions in Canada were designed to keep all the benefits with white people and to shield other people from being able to equally enjoy all the benefits of this stolen territory. Institutions that are designed to uphold white supremacy don't change because the leadership or the personnel changes. That's not how white supremacy works. Institutions that are designed to uphold something do that until you change those institutions. And we see to this day in this country that we still have an Indian Act. We still have a child welfare system that replaced residential schools, which still takes more indigenous people into its care than any other group of people in Canada. And, you know, we see a policing system in places like Lethbridge that is nine times more likely to stop a black person than a white person, and five times more likely in Lethbridge to stop an indigenous person than a white person. Stopping them not because of a crime that they are believed to be committing, but just because the state wants to hassle them, intimidate them, and take their information, document them, so that it can keep tabs on them and control people through this collection of information and this fear-based policing. That's the history of this country. That's the legacy of colonialism, of the enslavement of black and indigenous people in this country. And sadly, it takes a police station burning in another country for us to even reckon in many cases with what we're dealing with here. Because black and indigenous people have been talking from the beginning of settler colonialism about the realities that I'm here to speak with you today about. But Canada insists on trying to silence us, but we will not be silenced 
we are still here. You're seeing people in the streets in Canada, in the United States, and across the world saying that it's time to abolish the police, that police abolition is the new order because simply trying to reform an institution that was designed to control and kill us will not work and is not um, acceptable for our lives, that we don't want reform, we don't want fewer deaths, fewer arrests. I think carding is so important in Canada because carding gives us a better example of the scope of harmful police activity. Sometimes we only pay attention when the police take somebody's life, but that is not the extent of harmful police activity. The numerous videos that we are seeing of RCMP officers attacking and beating and trying to humiliate indigenous people, um, the recent death of Chantal Moore in New Brunswick, where the police went to do a so-called wellness check and ended up shooting her to death. A wellness check at the barrel of the gun. And this kind of behavior has been normalized in Canada. Responding to people who are in mental health crisis at the barrel of a gun has become a rational and normal thing to do. Responding to noise complaints in communities has become a rational and normal police response. These are the most violent responses that one can conceive of, but the white settler imagination that is afraid of black and indigenous resistance and uprising has tricked you into believing that responding in these kinds of violent militaristic ways is normal. It is not normal. It is completely inhuman. And that is why people are demanding abolishing police. You do not reform an inhuman system. You get rid of it and you start over. Immediately when black and indigenous people make these claims, we're met with a particular response. And that response is, well, then how will we maintain public safety? How will we maintain public safety if there isn't the ability to have an armed force that has the right to use lethal force against the public? How will we maintain safety? Well, I would just ask you, do you really believe that the only reason people behave is because the police could come and kill them or that the police could come and take them into prison and take away their freedom? Is your society truly being held together by the threat of punishment, loss of liberty, and death? If that is the method that you keep yourself safe, you need to reevaluate your society. Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about police abolition. Because, of course, my safety matters just as much as anybody else's. The life of Chantal Moore, or Aisha Hudson, or Jason Collins, or Regis Korchinski Paquette. These are all people who have been killed recently by our police forces in this country. Their lives mattered as well. So are we really going to send an armed interrupting force? to say that someone else's life is more important than those people who really pose no lethal threat to anyone. But that's what we've been doing in Canada and calling it law and order and policing. In my city, in Toronto, our police budget is $1.2 billion a year. Now you have to add up the next several municipal services to get to $1.2 billion. So what we are saying in Toronto is that the most important thing for living, for having a quality of life, is to have thousands of armed men roaming our streets, approaching children, approaching women who are walking alone at night, approaching our elders, and that those individuals are the only thing keeping us safe, and that they are more important than people in our communities who don't have housing people in our communities who don't have mental health supports, who don't have childcare, who don't have jobs, and who, if they do have a job, are not making a living wage. We have told ourselves that this paranoia of white supremacist policing is the most important thing that we have in our society. And so it's not that the governments don't spend money on black and indigenous people in Canada. They do. Billions and billions and billions of dollars. But do you know what services are most directed at black and indigenous people? 
the police forces, the courts, the prisons, the jails, and also the child welfare system. These are the places where the bulk of money in Canada is being spent towards black and indigenous people. Is it making our society safer? Of course it's not. Is it making our society better? No. Is it setting us up for a better future? Of course it isn't. But out of paranoia, the white settler state says, but if we didn't do that, it would be even worse. And they have tried to brainwash our society into believing that lie. And so I come to you today to suggest an alternative, to demand an alternative to the violence that is policing. When somebody in our community is having a mental health crisis, we do need to do something. We need to respond. The way that we respond, though, is with somebody who has de-escalation training, with somebody who knows how to provide primary health care and is willing to do so. I cannot tell you the number of times the police are called to the scene, engage in violence against somebody, and then leave that person to bleed or to die because they are unwilling to administer first aid after they are called first responders. The police are not first responders. I just want to be really clear about that. They are law enforcement. That's it. That's all they do. Um, if somebody in our community is playing their music too loud and it's late at night, we don't need somebody with a gun and a license to kill to go and address that problem. And in fact, I would argue that the state doesn't even need to be involved in such a problem. But again, if you live in a white supremacist culture and you use the hammer of policing to solve all your problems, every, every problem looks like a nail in your hammer. We have violent interventions into everyday situations that people solve all the time. So I mentioned that my father is a retired mental health nurse. People with mental health issues are among the most likely people in this country to be murdered by the police. But my father, who worked as a mental health nurse, never had the right to use force against any of the people that he worked with. He was expected to work with them in a different way. and. These are the exact same people that the police end up taking the lives of. But the civilian population has to find another way, has to de-escalate, has to talk, has to think. And then you will say, well, Desmond, but if things get out of hand, they will call the police. We don't call the police to take someone's life. So the force that we would call has to have different tools, different tactics, and different permissions under the law. You've probably heard about the notion of defunding the police, about disarming the police, and about abolishing police forces altogether. So I want to talk about those three things, and then perhaps I will end and we can begin our discussion. Um, defunding the police, and that is taking money out of police budgets and reinvesting it into the kinds of helping services that I'm telling you about, that is a means of abolition, in my view. We are not putting our lives at risk during a pandemic, going out into the streets and demonstrating so that we can take a little bit of money away from the police, so that we can fractionally reduce their budgets. Because we are not looking to fractionally reduce police violence. We are not looking to fractionally reduce the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people, many of whom disappear or die when the police are the last persons that they interact with. We are not looking to have a fractional reduction of these issues. We are not looking for a little less carding and surveillance and following and stalking and documenting in our communities. Those behaviors are unacceptable on their face. So anybody who offers us defunding of police forces without an actual fear that in response to the overwhelming violence that the RCMP is capable of, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is now recommending that the RCMP wear body-worn cameras. We all saw the images of George Floyd being murdered by the police in the United States. 
they knew that they were being filmed. It didn't change the fact that they engaged in murder in the case of Derek Chauvin or watched the murder happen and aided and abetted it in the case of his police colleagues. They knew they were being filmed. When we say Black Lives Matter, why do we say that? I'll tell you why. Because somebody like Justin Trudeau would rather watch Black and Indigenous people die on camera after the fact and have an adjudication about whether or not that was okay than to stop the violence at its root, which is what we are actually demanding. Body cameras are a solution to a problem that nobody has offered. No one's saying that, that the problem is that we can't see police violence. We refuse to see the violence even when it's right in front of our faces. And by the way, a state-sponsored autopsy ruled that George Floyd didn't die because he was choked by the police officer, but he died because of pre-existing health conditions. In the white settler imagination, even being able to watch someone die is not evidence that they were murdered. And so body cameras cannot solve the problem that we are trying to solve. They can perhaps make the settler state look like it's concerned that it is taking action. But that does not protect our lives. Body cameras also increase budgets. So what we're doing is we're saying that the police are murderers, and so we're going to reward them by giving them more toys. In Toronto, when we did a pilot project on body cameras, the police decided when to turn the camera on or off. Now, people will say to me, well, Desmond, I, I don't agree with that. I think that if you have a body camera program, then the camera should be on all the time. But let me ask you, you continue to put your trust in a police force that actually wants that ability to turn the camera on or off. They want to control their own accountability, and we treat that as if, oh, well, you know, they, they just shouldn't be allowed to, rather than a complete treachery of the presumed role of serve and protect that the police are offering us. We are not going back. We are not going back to a world where these kinds of acts of violence are normalized and are swept away. We have to fight for justice for indigenous Are you there? Yeah, sorry, I just had a little blip there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful, sorry. I am wrapping up, but we have to fight for justice for black and indigenous people and there are no compromises for our liberation. Our liberation is not going to come incrementally when white people are ready to take their knee off of our neck. It has to come now, and it has to come by getting to the root of the issue. If someone is beating you up with a stick, you don't say, let me give you training on how to use that stick differently. You don't say, let me put a camera on you so that I can watch how you beat people with the stick. You take the stick away. And even beyond notions of abolition, the very, very first two things that need to change in any police overhaul situation are, number one, the laws that say a police officer can take your life if they are afraid for their own life or for the life of the public, that law needs to be removed. That is at the heart of all of this, even more than the funding that the police receive, the laws that protect from prosecution. And then the second thing that needs to happen Happen, is that no person who calls themselves a first responder and who intervenes in our communities should have a weapon, ever. And if anybody who is a first responder ever uses a weapon or uses force in an instance where they are responding to the community, they must face the same level of accountability that you or I would face if we were engaging in the same behavior. We have to do those two things, take away the license to kill and take away the weapons. And then we can talk about where the funding should go, go to provide services that provide care, assistance, medical treatment. And the rest of this money that the police are absorbing every year is actually going back to address 
poverty, the leading cause of social dysfunction, which we never talk about in these conversations. Poverty. Why, why are people releasing certain people and not others? Because, because they are protecting me and the well-being of the rich. And it is dirty that seem to be needed to be policed. Why don't you just give us money instead of the police? The problem is the problem. Black lives matter, indigenous lives matter, and we refuse to go back. That is why that image of the police station burning in Minneapolis gives me, not because I wanted it to come to that, but because black people have the right to defend ourselves when no one else will, and we will continue to do that until the day that we see a more just world. Thank you very, very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very powerful talk uh, today. Oh, your image just went. Sorry, let me just fix that. There you go. Um, we're, um, my apologies for the poor connection uh, on Skype. We somehow have have some something happening on Skype that's fairly poor. Um, so my apologies for that. Um, both to Desmond and to the people watching. Um, I'll start right away with the first question. Um, Bev Mandel asks the question, how do we change the court system and prison system when they are based on laws that are embedded in colonialism? That's a great question. Um, I believe the answer is to change the laws. Um, we have drug laws in this country that are criminalizing unbelievable amounts of black, indigenous, and other racialized people. Justin Trudeau said that he was going to legalize marijuana. And yet, what he has failed to do is to grant a pardon for all of those people whose lives have been destroyed by possession charges and by trafficking charges. I mean, the government is now the largest trafficker of marijuana in this country. So it wasn't okay when ordinary people were trafficking marijuana, but now we're saying it's okay when the government does it. All the charges that are still holding people back, that show up when they try to get a job, whether it's simple possession or whether it's trafficking, I don't make a distinction. I don't think that we have to divide the good criminals from the bad criminals, from the understandable criminals to the crimes of necessity. The government is now the trafficker. If the government can traffic in marijuana, it has to take away all of these convictions of people who formerly trafficked in marijuana and let them out of jail. Nobody should be in jail for trafficking drugs in Canada. And that should never happen again. But you see, because black and indigenous people have borne the most harm for this kind of policing, how do we have to make money off of marijuana? Not how do we have justice? So laws like that need to be taken away because our jails and prisons are full of people who don't need to be there. Um, ultimately, the money that is spent in our courts and the money that is spent in jail and prison, and I would add immigration detention, all that money, the billions, the untold billions. You know, guys, things like carding happen and people will say, well, you should... Uh, you should fight that. You should fight that in the courts. So my life gets interrupted by a so-called peace officer who is not keeping the peace. And you want me to get a lawyer and go to court where a judge making $300,000 a year is going to preside over whether or not the police have the right to stop me. And of course, because the laws are what they are, the police are going to be given the benefit of the doubt 99.9 .9 times out of 100. Lawyers get paid. Judges get paid. Court reporters get paid, and we lose money to fight for something that should never have even happened in the first place, fight against it. Um, this is madness, and it keeps a lot of people employed. This is the thing that I wanted to say during the talk that I didn't. Um, white supremacy is not simply in place because it upholds a racist hierarchy. People benefit from the racial hierarchy. Think about all of the white caseworkers 
who are handling files in Children's Aid today and overseeing the taking away of indigenous and black children from their families. Like that's their job. They make a living overseeing that when they don't have a right to do that. All the money we spend in child welfare could be put back into the families that we say can't take care of children. In Manitoba, 87% of child welfare cases involve poverty. Poverty. People think that child welfare is all about parents beating up their children. In the main, it is not. 87% of the cases in Manitoba are people being apprehended, children being apprehended from their parents or their guardians because the state deems them to be too poor to take care of those children properly. Well, that's a hundreds of millions of dollars industry just in one province. Why wouldn't that money go towards the families themselves? Why is it that rich people who harm or abuse their children don't get their children taken away? Why are they given options for counseling and support while poor people are separated from one another? These are the things that we need to think about. We need to go deep, deep into the legal frameworks of this country and dismantle them. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Often the least liked person in school, i.e. the bullies, end up in law enforcement. Obviously that needs to change, but how? So again, um, I'm for abolishing the police. Uh, the problem isn't that the right people don't get to become police officers. The problem are the legal protections that police officers have. I will give you an example. Here in the greater Toronto area, there was a young black man named DeAndre Campbell who was shot and killed by Peel Regional Police Officers in Brampton on April 6th of this year. DeAndre was living with mental health issues and the police had been called to his house many times before and were familiar with him. On this particular day in April, DeAndre called the police himself. He wasn't feeling well and he called 911 and the police were sent to his house. The two police officers who responded to that call decided to use force against DeAndre. One of them deployed a taser against him, and uh, my understanding is that the other police officer shot him twice in the chest. That police officer fired his weapon and killed DeAndre Campbell is refusing now to give any testimony to the Special Investigations Unit that investigates these kinds of issues. Now, you may argue that it's his legal and constitutional right not to incriminate himself. Every person in Canada actually has the right, if they're accused of something, not to uh, incriminate themselves. That's true. But I'll tell you what the problem is. Police take notes after every single call and every single response that they do. That is a legal requirement of theirs. Those notes are not the officer's personal and private property. They belong to the government, but even the notes are not being seized in this case. I don't care who you are or why you got into policing. If you have that kind of legal protection over a regular human being, you're not going to act right. Like you're always going to have people who abuse that and then their colleagues, the so-called good cops, will crowd around them and shelter them. Police union officials will come out and say that we need to wait for all the facts to be in because this is how they consolidate their power. So that's not actually an issue of training or recruitment, as people would like to think. If we've done, we've seen all, I don't know if you guys are familiar, I don't even remember the name of it, that really famous study where they took university students in a dorm and they said, some of you are going to be prison guards and some of you are going to be prisoners. And it was a totally, you know, manufactured, like, research experiment. And yet, within just a few hours of the research experiment beginning, the people who were designated as prison guards started abusing the people who were prisoners. When you give people a disproportionate amount of power over somebody else, you are encouraging them to use that power. And when you have no accountability mechanisms, you are just saying whatever you make as a decision is the right decision. I want to stop going uh, on a personal level about these issues of policing 
and start getting structural. And structurally, no guns, no license to kill, and then let's see how you respond to a crisis. Let's see how you do when you don't have the authority to use that kind of violence and then when no one is going to protect you when you do. That's actually what the issue is. Our next question comes from Colleen Quintel. Desmond, I understand that I don't understand. How can I, as an ally, make a difference? So two things about that. Thank you for the question. I want people to stop using the word ally. Who called you an ally to my struggle? Did you give yourself that title? Why do you need a title for our collective liberation and our collective peace and safety? Why do you need a title to do that? You don't need a title to do it. You don't need to call yourself my ally. Um, so I think we need to get rid of that language. But I would say that the second thing is we are all on a lifelong learning journey. Um, and many of us are on a healing journey because we've been so so harmed by the, the things that this world produces for us that trying to fight back is extremely re-traumatizing and, and hurtful. And so knowledge that I have to share with you today, because I am black, I had to do the work and I am still on my lifelong learning journey. I read. I read the work of black and indigenous writers and thinkers and scholars and activists that has been available to us for decades. I do that all the time so that I can continue to challenge myself. My ideas about abolition today and the necessity for it um, are not these held. I was once a very reformist, you know, small L liberal minded kind of person. And I believe that the system could be changed for the better. It is only through reading and listening and challenging myself that I have come to the conclusion that we actually need more than reform, that reform is an insult to what we suffer. It's not good enough. So I would encourage you to read, to listen, and to make that part of really engagement. One thing I'm seeing is that white people who never engage in these conversations before are now very, very eager to do something like right away. We've got to do something like right now. No, no. If you want to do something right now, support the people who have been doing this work in your communities for ages. And they are all around you. I met them when I came to Lethbridge. Um, people have been doing this work and many people have not been listening or honoring those struggles and that work. So that is how you can help while you continue on your learning journey to educate yourself. White supremacy tells white people that they always have to stand in the front, that they always have to have the, loud, the loudest voice, and indeed should be speaking because they have more credibility towards the authorities than we do. That can't be the future that we build. So and the sentiment of wanting to call yourself an ally, but in reality, you just need do the work and yeah i'm still here okay uh, sure next last... hmm? i hope that you got most of that last answer it's we got most of it it's just the last sentence that kind of got cobbled okay do you want to repeat it or? I don't really remember. I think what okay. I said. Yeah, I know that, you were uh, in the stream. We, we have to, we have to set, we have to center the voices and experiences of people who have been fighting this and, and to really prop them up. That's what I was saying. Okay. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. What do you have to say about the recent mass murders in NS by Gabriel Wartman? What would be the police? What would the police have done without weapons and the right to use force? That is an excellent question, and I'm grateful for it. 
Um, first of all, why did Gabriel Wartman dress up as an RCMP officer? Why was Gabriel Wartman obsessed with the power of police? Because he knew that when he was going to go out and commit his act of premeditated murder, his killing spree, that the, the easiest way for him to pass himself off as somebody who was safe and somebody who had the right kind of authority was to dress up like a police officer, like an RCMP officer, and to drive a car that looked like an RCMP car. He was able to kill another RCMP officer by making her believe that he was her colleague. So Heidi Stevenson was murdered by this man specifically because she thought that he was one of them. Um, um, because we have given the civilian population so many weapons in this country, which I do not agree with, we're always going to have that threat now that somebody can try to do what Gabriel Wartman did. I do believe in having a reserve force that it is only deployed in situations like that one, where there is an active shooter and where the use of de-escalation is probably not going to be sufficient. My problem is that that Gabriel Wartman situation is used as the ultimate example of policing when it is the most rare ex exception thing that we can imagine. The need, need to use guns to hunt somebody who is actively killing other people. He killed 14 women at Ecole Polytechnique. There was no time for any police officers to get there. And even in situations like the murder of Sammy Yatim on a streetcar here in Toronto in 2013, no other officers had their guns drawn besides James Forsillo. But once he decided to draw his gun and threaten Sammy Yatim, you notice that none of his fellow officers tried to stop him. So the idea that the everyday police officer should have the right to a gun and to lethal force is very, very wrong-headed. There are a small, fractional number of situations where an armed and trained response team, not beat officers on, officers on the street, on the, street, on the street every by I'm, for, I'm sorry to say meeting for force force with force that's the madness of giving the population so and the other thing we have to do with that issue in my opinion is we have to disarm most of the civilian population these are things if you think that a cop racing scene is going to stop a bad guy with a gun you're the one living in the fantasy world gabriel wartman had killed 22 people by the time the police got to him. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. The other thing I'll say is Gabriel Wartman had a history of domestic assault that people ignored. Gabriel Wartman attacked a 15-year-old boy outside of his dental clinic. There were so many signs before he went on a killing ramp. This notion that you, just, you can't stop a killer. People knew for years that this man was stockpiling weapons and getting replica police cars, but because it's so normal to worship police violence, nobody thought to report him, nobody thought that anything could be done. Actually, I did hear a report that people did report Gabriel Wartman to the Halifax police, and it still wasn't taken seriously. So if your last line of defense is the men with the guns, they really have to be the absolute last line of defense. They can't be the man walking through a neighborhood talking to children with a Glock on his hip. So again, we have to go back to the root of the problem. Um, that, that's the only kind of force with weapons that I would countenance, and they would never walk the streets. They would never, never, ever walk the streets. They would only be deployed in specific cases like that emergency in Nova Scotia. Uh, burning down a police station is not violence, it's property destruction. I'm so tired of the murder, the murder 
of black and indigenous people being equated with the smashing of a window or the burning of a building. How dare any person in this society equate those two things? If you think that people responding to a murder is the same thing as the murder itself, you need to re-examine your priorities. If it wasn't for that property, who murdered George Floyd would still be free because the DA had all the evidence necessary to charge him and his colleagues, but thought that they were going to get away with another murder. People in Minneapolis said, well, not this time. You really think that responding to a murder by burning down a Target or a Walmart is an act of violence? And I think you need to re, re in your definitions of you that those two things can be equated. Obviously not, but again, the police shouldn't exist. So let's start there. If you don't have armed roaming men walking the streets of your city, then you're going to solve a lot of these problems before they start. But no, of course, no police force has the right to investigate itself. And again, the fact that our governments have operated as if that is normal, why, why, is, why is there such a desire, I would ask, I guess, to see that as just a mistake. Like, oh, you know, we really thought that they would be able to investigate themselves, but they've unfortunately proven us wrong. Can we stop playing games, please? This is a game. Pretending that the police were ever going to fairly investigate themselves and hold themselves accountable, that's a game and a ruse to uphold white supremacy. It's never been true. So, of course, the police don't have the authority to investigate themselves, but if you're gonna give them the authority to use the amounts of force that they do, you're gonna let them get away with it. Because if we had to prosecute every single police officer who actually engaged in a misconduct or a violent act or a killing, well, <laughs> I mean, the records, just to show you guys how simply this can be demonstrated, you can't find out the disciplinary history of any police officer in Canada without a huge, huge fight. Those informations aren't publicly available. Shouldn't we know if a police officer engages in misconduct? There's actually a police officer in Toronto who killed two different black men years apart from one another. And the first time that Rick Shank did that, he wasn't actually even criminally charged. And so because he wasn't charged, Nobody knew the identity of the police officer who had committed murder. And then he did it again years later. That time, he was criminally charged, but he beat the charges in court. The idea that those two instances of police murder were both justified, that might be a legal outcome, but it is not a moral outcome. We cannot morally accept that that is a fair outcome for murder. And so, no, police forces should not investigate themselves, but before that, they shouldn't have the ability to kill that requires investigation. Okay. It seems th that um, some people couldn't hear the question, so I'm just going to repeat the question you just answered to make sure that people understood the question. The question was from Lisa Lambert, the violence of police forces... The violence of police forces is defended by the internal investigations that usually end up funding, that usually end up finding that the violence was justified. Should police be able to investigate themselves? That was the question that Desmond just answered. Um, our following question is from Martin Heavyhead. Outside of, Ta outside of Tabor, Alberta, there are white supremacists, militants, who have been stockpiling weapons waiting for the quote, race war. Without something like police, how do we deal with extremist groups? Um, this is another really good question. And again, I think that we're in a situation now where we've allowed white civilians to stockpile weapons 
and we're saying that the only people who can disarm them are more white police officers with weapons. Um, this is a very troubling situation. And um, I think that the government needs to take some steps to first say to people, we're going to give you the opportunity to voluntarily give up your weapons because you don't have a right to them. You don't have a right to stockpile weapons for your own personal use in Canada. So we're going to give you a chance to surrender them. And if you don't want to surrender them, then we're going to have to take certain sanctions against you. We might have to take certain th sanctions against you that relate to, I don't know, other things that the government issues to you. Your ability to drive, your ability to file for licenses, your um, ability to get a tax return. Maybe we withhold your tax return until you sacrifice up your weapons. You don't have a right to them. Like the government takes away the liberty of black and indigenous people for nothing and then has to have like a crisis of conscience about what to do about white men stockpiling weapons. Come down on them, take away their rights, take away their privileges. But I wouldn't say storm in there with guns and have a shootout because I don't believe in that and it's just gonna end in more carnage. And I don't believe that the people who would have to be sent in to do that kind of military operation should be sacrificed in that way. We have to find another way. And so we need to ban the use of these kinds of weapons in our country. And we're not hearing any conversation about that. And that has to happen first because until we do that, until we stop the shipping of weapons coming into Canada legally from other places, then we actually can't stop this stockpiling. By the way, one of the greatest ways that people in militias get weapons is by stealing them from police. People who get into police forces are known. The RCMP has hundreds of missing and stolen weapons. And where do you think they're going? But of course, we also have to acknowledge the fact that groups like the, the Proud Boys and the Soldiers of Odin, um, who act as their own militias are deeply tied to police and military in this country. So you're, you're kind of sending white supremacists to go get the white supremacists if you're sending the military or the police to go after these men who are stockpiling weapons. There's an alliance between these same people. So there's no immediate answer, Martin. There's no tomorrow answer. We should never have let it get to a point where we let people stockpile weapons and now we want an easy answer to that. There isn't. But if the government can take away my liberty walking down the street, they can certainly take away the liberty of a person who's stockpiling weapons and they use them to harm the civilian population. They just have to get more creative than they are. But you see, when it's white people, it's like, oh, we have to follow the law, we have to follow the rules. We never get that consideration as black and indigenous people just for trying to live our lives. So I would encourage the government to get creative on the white supremacists, the way that it gets creative on us, trumping up charges on young children, taking indigenous people on starlight tours and leaving them in the middle of nowhere. The creativity of the sickening police forces in this country is off the charts, and they can always find a way to get away with it, but they can't come down on a few people who are stockpiling weapons. I don't believe that. We have to do better. Um, Poppy card. Um mentions the Stanford prison experiment. I think that's the experiment you were referring to earlier. Yeah. Thank you, um, yes it is. Next question is Laurie Schultz. Is there a difference, and then in bracket, less, fat fas less fatalities in the UK between police interactions with people of color? And if so, can you comment? I don't know what the statistics are in the United Kingdom. But I do know that for a long time, frontline police officers in the United Kingdom have never been armed. They don't carry guns. And um, I believe that that is more about a principle than it is about certain outcomes. They've simply decided that that's not the way that they want to organize their society. But you see actually in Europe that the um, civilian police forces look a lot different than from what they do in Canada and the United States. And that is because the police forces that we have in Canada and the United States were developed for two very specific reasons. So you remember at the beginning of my talk, I said that white supremacist institutions are the ones that protect and re 
um, and perpetuate the ideology. So it's not just that people have like racist ideas in their head, it's that they create institutions to make sure that those ideas get honored throughout the generations. What are the origins of policing in North America as are different from Europe? In North America, things like the Northwestern Mounted Police or the frontier sheriff kind of model in the United States, those police forces were designed specifically to push indigenous peoples off of land that white settlers wanted for themselves. And the idea was if you don't get off of the land, well, we can overpower you and we can murder you. So you'd best listen to what we say. The fact that RCMP officers are still harassing and beating, I, I, I saw a video this morning, I couldn't even watch it, of several police officers attacking an indigenous chief, taking him out of his car, throwing him to the ground and beating him. There is a legacy of hundreds of years behind an activity like that. It's not a one-off. That's what the police, the Northwestern Mount of Police, now the RCMP, were designed to do. The other form of policing that is novel to Canada and the United States is the tradition of the slave catcher. The tradition of the person whose job it was to make sure that if a black or indigenous person who was enslaved tried to run away from the property that they were forced to work at, that the slave catcher would go and get them and bring them back. And when we talk about carding in places like Lethbridge, the history of carding that now affects black people in Lethbridge more than anybody else, why is that? Because the police in the slave catcher era in Canada and in the United States needed the right to identify any black person that they saw walking the streets. Hey, what if that's Jim's boy? What if Jim's boy is wandering off the property and trying to run away? We need to be able to identify him. We need to be able to check on him. And now the police call carding street checks. That is the legacy of policing. But you see, in Europe, where everybody was white and happy and friendly, those same tactics of policing were never deployed in the same ways as they've been deployed here. So Great Britain just decided that it wanted to take a different path, and we can do the same thing if we want to. I don't have the statistics, but no matter what they show, an armed response is never going to cut it for me. Okay. Desmond, I just want to check in with you because it's now two minutes past uh, 11 or two minutes past one your time. And um, we do still have three questions in the live stream, but I'm really sensitive to towards your own time limits and want to make sure how you feel about that before we proceed. I was literally going to suggest when you started saying that, that maybe we should take about three more. So if there are actually three more questions, that is, that's perfect. Okay. Three it is. Uh, Poppy car. Today, someone posted a Confederate flag. He's not worth it, but the people really impact, uh, impacted are like my husband who's tired and traumatized. Should I try to engage this in brackets friend? of ours and if so how if this is a person that's known to you that you have some kind of relationship um you could do so now um i don't know the identity of the person asking the question but if you're black i wouldn't be the one to engage in that conversation with somebody posting a confederate flag um, the Americans have long hidden behind the idea of the Confederate flag representing Southern pride. We all know that that's nonsense. The Confederate flag is a symbol of the right to continue fighting for slavery and the right to have a regime that was explicitly white supremacist in its ideology. Um, so if you're not black and you feel comfortable enough to engage with this person who I think you should only really probably engage if they have a relationship with you, I wouldn't do it online. I would find another way to talk to them, maybe even in a telephone call. Because you know, if we're going to engage in these conversations genuinely, it has to actually matter and people have to be willing to take war. So I would contact them directly. 
whether it be by phone or even if it's possible to see them face to face. I know that's hard during COVID, but we can still see each other at a distance. And I would say, what does that symbol mean to you? And start a conversation. And then I'd say, so here's what the symbol means historically. Because a symbol like the Confederate flag is not allowed to have different meanings for different people. That's not okay. History is what history is. John A. MacDonald in this country is a white supremacist for all time. He doesn't get to be rehabilitated as the founding father of this country because people liked the country that he established. John A. MacDonald said that indigenous peoples were of the soil as if they were animals, you know, and that they didn't, you know, they didn't have the understanding that the British had. He said that Chinese people couldn't vote because they had no aspiration to Britishness. Uh, he didn't think that black people were human. And there are statues of him and monuments and schools named after him all across this country. So if you want to celebrate him, you can't say that it's for a different reason. All, all those things still stand as historical realities. But I think it's worth trying to engage the person outside of that online milieu. Say, what does this symbol mean to you? And then say, here's what the symbol means historically. And do you care that it means that for other people? Are you willing to challenge the fact that it might not mean that to you, but that that's actually what the history is? We only get to have one history. It doesn't get to be subjective for different people. So it is worth challenging that other person to make them think differently about that history and to understand how harmful it is today to perpetuate that through that flag. I mean, okay, um, we don't need a Stanford prison experiment when we have police and actual prisons in everyday life. Has anybody here in this chat um, ever been able to visit a prison and monitor what the prison guards do to people on a daily basis? Has anybody in this chat seen the inside of a prison? Why is prison one of the most hidden away places in the world from public view and public accountability? Because they do not want you to see what happens inside of a prison. We don't need an experiment about prisons when we have real prison where people are abused and tortured every single day. And you know what really bothers me about that? Is that when we reveal what happens in prison, people say, well, they're criminals. So before... We were denying the violence, and then when it is revealed to us, we say, well, maybe people deserve the violence. I don't need an experiment. I talk to people in prison all the time. We don't need an experiment. Prison is perhaps the most depraved creation of Western society, and it needs to also be abolished. And if you don't believe me, talk to people in prison. It's kind of hard to do because the state doesn't want you to see but talk to the advocates who work, work with people in prison. Talk to people who have been released from prison and ask them if any basic standard of human rights are maintained inside of those places. Prison guards are like police officers. They have unbelievable disproportionate amounts of power to hurt other people, and they are almost never held accountable for that. So if we saw prison uh, guards going to jail all the, time, all the time because they were abusing people, I might care that the prison Stanford study has been disputed, but that's a study and we're talking about real life. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Dasman. Do you have any um, last parting words for us before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you to the organizers once again. And I also want to say that these conversations are extremely, extremely difficult for me to engage in because, as I was just alluding to, they are not hypotheticals. Um, for many people who don't engage with these issues on a daily basis, who are not being stalked in their communities by the police as we are, 
do not have relatives in jail as we do, who are not remembering the names of victims who look like them, this can become an academic exercise. And that can lead people like me to seem, I suppose, irrational or angry or unreasonable about the so-called other side. And I own that. I am angry. I am worse than angry. I'm outraged. And I wrote a book that came out at the beginning of this year called The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. And it took me like four years to write that book because um, I've been documenting what I'm talking to you about and what the world seems to be waking up to now for years. And what, what I'm afraid of right now is huge light on issues that many of us have been talking about for a long time. But that spotlight is about to go away once the mainstream media loses interest in us again and find something else to focus on. So yes, I am angry. I'm outraged. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. But my struggle is your struggle, whether you realize it or not. Black people had to fight in Canada to desegregate lunch counters to allow black athletes to play in professional sports. Every professional league in Canada was segregated until black people started fighting to desegregate them. Every profession, all professional fields and professional institutes were segregated in Canada. Nursing, being a doctor, being able to um, earn a, a, a good living as a teacher or in certain manufacturing jobs. We had to desegregate all of these things with our bodies and to put our lives on the line. But do you know something? When Canada did things like bring in the Civil Rights Act or the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, those rights benefited everybody. Even though everybody wasn't fighting for them, the rights that were brought in legally were protections for every person. So you don't have to appreciate our struggle. It is a universal struggle. When we say Black Lives Matter, that is not an exclusive um, articulation. We are part of the all lives that people love to refer to when we say that. We are, we are part of that. And saying that our specific lives matter is not a threat to you. So I know people are often very threatened and taken aback and troubled by the things that I am saying. But there is no, nothing more troubling than the injustices that we are fighting against. So just remember that if you enjoy your freedoms today, it's because somebody else, probably somebody who doesn't look like you, was willing to fight and willing to sacrifice themselves so that everybody else could have freedom. And that is all that the tradition that I am continuing and that black activists and indigenous activists across this country are continuing to do today. Just as the Wet'suwet'en people are fighting to protect land and water that all of us can eat from and drink from in the future. It is not just their struggle. So I want to encourage people to see past what they might feel is anger or irrationality and just consider that no amount of compensation can give me back my freedom if it's taken away, can give us back the lives of people like Regis Korczynski Paquette, Chantal Moore, DeAndre Campbell, Jamal Francique, their lives will never be returned to us no matter how far or how hard we fight for them. So this isn't for our benefit, it's for the benefit of future generations. And you need to be able to see past the hurt and the anger that we rightly feel and understand that this is about you and your liberation as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today and I'm going to end the live stream. Thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much.